In May 2020, current UCL history students came together to reflect on their experiences at UCL history and to pass on their tips and advice to future cohorts of incoming undergraduates through a series of thematic panel discussions. The idea underpinning the project is for current students to help future cohorts to transition smoothly into life in our department and to create a stronger sense of community within the department. The project is led by Dr Chloe Ayrton and Dr Patrick Lanchner and builds on the work the two of them started with the History Society at the induction weekend in 2019, where they hosted a panel discussion with students on the theme of being a historian at university. Building on the concept of hosting panel discussions with current students, over the course of four days in May 2020, current students and history tutors came together to reflect on the experience of studying history at UCL and life in London. This video is one of the nine panel discussions that we produced for the project. Welcome to our second panel discussion with current UCL history students. This is panel discussion two, life as a UCL history student, focus on academic matters from first year to third year or fourth year, intellectual journeys, managing workloads, and making the most of life in the department. This discussion forms part of our UCL history undergraduate induction student panel discussions project. Hi, my name is Jay Burrows. I'm a third year history student here at UCL um, and I'm co-convener of this project alongside Chloe. My particular research interests are situated in gender history in modern Germany, particularly sexual violence in the Holocaust. I will be pursuing these interests further as of October at the University of Oxford, where I'll be doing a master's in modern European history. And I'm also the current UCL History Society president. Hi, my name is Lisa. I'm a third year student going into my fourth year as I did my year abroad at the University of British Columbia, the Vancouver campus. During my degree, my main interests are the history of Latin America and the history of drugs. Hopefully, after my undergraduate, I am going to do a master's in either history or migration policy. Hi there, my name's Toby and I'm a third and final year history student at UCL. During my degree, I had a particular interest in religious relations in the early modern period, specialising in my final year on the Ottoman Empire. My extracurricular activities that I have interest in include working for the International Relations Society, being involved with the cross-country team and the Christian Union. Hi, my name is Sinead Owen. I'm a third year undergraduate history student at UCL and I've been fortunate enough to study a really diverse range of modules, but my Specific areas of interest uh, are the history of crime and punishment in 20th century America, as well as American history in Hollywood film. Hi, I'm Jude. I'm in my final year. Um, I did my dissertation on the 16th century Caribbean and looked at English and Spanish racial attitudes towards black Africans. I'm also interested in religious history um, in medieval Europe and any kind of intellectual history. I'm probably going to do a master's, but I'm not entirely sure when or where. I'm just kind of sussing out the current situation. Hi, my name is Kristen Allison and I am a second year history with a year abroad student. I am hoping to go to the University of California, Santa Barbara at some point in 2021. And I am particularly interested in American foreign policy and immigration history. As with most 20 year olds, I'm not really sure what I want to do in the future, but I am interested in possibly going into diplomacy or working for NGOs. My name is Carrie Tui and I'm the departmental tutor in the UCL history department. My role is to oversee the academic progress and the welfare of all of our undergraduate students and that includes coordinating our personal tutoring system. That's something that you'll hear more about in these induction videos. I studied history as an undergraduate and also as a master's student and then I became a secondary school history teacher before I joined UCL in my current role. I really hope you find these videos useful and I'm looking forward to helping you make the transition to university in September. And then we have my wonderfully esteemed colleague, Lily Chang, who's a historian of late imperial and modern China, specialising in the formation of legal measures pertaining to the military during the Second Sino-Japanese War. And at the moment is also the chair of the exam board. So very involved in, in um, rules about assessment and, um, you know, helping us as a department to have sort of a streamlined process and uh, also teaches a wide range of undergraduate modules. Hi, I'm Chloe Ayrton. I'm a lecturer here in the history department at UCL and I am leading, along with my colleague, Dr. Patrick Lanchner, this really exciting project called UCL 
history student induction video resources, which really is part of the work that he and I are both doing in September to welcome in the new cohort of incoming undergraduate students. And we've been leading a series of panel discussions with current students to talk about various themes of life as a history student here at UCL. And you'll be seeing quite a lot of me over the course of these videos because I am uh, chairing all of the discussions. Um, so I just wanted to kind of get us started off thinking a little bit about um, you know, this sort of transition that you've all made and, and what if we had to explain to someone what life as a UCL history student looks like from an academic point of view, you know, trying to reflect a little bit on that. And um, the first thing that came up in our conversations in the morning was thinking about um, the structure of the degree and the way in which it's sort of a kind of toolkit in a way in, in that it helps you, the modules, the early modules help you make this really smooth transition from your A-levels into sort of the life of an academic historian at university, right? And I was really fascinated by a lot of the things that um, you were talking about when, we, when in our earlier panel, we were talking about how terrifying it is to make that transition, um, to actually sort of think about the ways in which the modules help you make it. So I just wonder, um, you know, perhaps uh, Jade might want to sort of start us off thinking about that. Yeah, so, um, yeah, for me, coming from like, quite a small state school. Um, I was very, very intimidated first coming to UCL um, because every time I told everyone, uh, people at my school that I was going to UCL, they were like, oh, are you? <laughs> um, so it's, it's really scary experience, but UCL of all the unis, I'm like my friends go to other unis, of what I'm aware has like one of the best transition programs, like just full stop. Um, they, the, the course is structured to help you transition from a level to university study so your whole like a lot of your first year is actually dedicated to providing you with the skills that you need to like write a good history essay and I feel like that's something that's quite rare in like the general scheme of universities because I feel like some other universities have a tendency to like throw people in at the deep end a bit and UCL that's not the case at all so um you have like a module uh, called writing history that's specifically dedicated to like teaching you how to write at undergraduate level um, there's also making history, which helps you like handle like material culture and like source work and like navigating the archives and how to find sources you need for essays. Um, and there's also approaching, which kind of branches out and tells you about all the different kinds of history that are out there. Um, and I think for me coming into UCL, that was such a big help because at A level, everything's quite constricted. You're not really like it's just history. There's not really and like you're not really aware of like any other kinds of history or approaches um, and ways to manage things. So um, having that toolkit there in first year really helps you transition. Not only in first year, but like you grow on those skills as you go through your degree. So you will like utilize them throughout the whole time you're here, which I think is so so beneficial um, in terms of just. Yeah, you just feel supported at like every step of the way, which I think um, really benefited me personally. Yeah, I think the two main things that I've noticed that are different between A-level and undergraduate history are primary sources and historiography. Uh, I mean, I'll let someone else talk about the primary sources because I'm a massive fan of historiography and that is currently my favourite thing to do within history. Just seeing this conversation and tracing it throughout the years and seeing how other people have built on other people's work and how those arguments have been complicated and then seeing how your ideas fit within this overall scheme of the debate and how you can contribute to it. I think it's very, very difficult, especially when you start. But then for me personally, it became the most rewarding thing to do because you actually see yourself as a historian. It lets you see that your ideas are valid and you are able to build on everyone else's work and come up with something new and I think that for me was kind of when I got the hang of historiography I think I started feeling more confident in my overall work throughout the degree. I think I was probably just reminded when thinking about what Jay was saying about how good the UCL transition period actually is is how little I appreciated that at the time and so I think my attitude was particularly probably because I'd come from an A-level background where a lot of it, you know, there's not much teacher student relationship actually from probably some of the coursework essays. I was like, no, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to kind of that's the whole point about being independent when you come to university is making sure you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And that's the way you kind of go about doing work. And that's a really bad attitude. Like independent study is fantastic and there are wonderful things you can do by yourself. 
But if the department gives you all these incredible resources, modules designed specifically to help you write an essay, courses that introduce you to the main concepts of history, you know, you should make use of them. And I, I'm kicking myself for not taking note of them earlier on, actually appreciating how important, how influential they would be a year, two years down the line in my actual you know, attempts to do research, um, for primary research by myself. And so really making use of the then advice um, was something I regret not doing. And I'd wish I'd taken more of a, a heated of that advice from, from, from peers at the time. Um, so, yeah. No, Hopefully future students will hear you and, and take that on. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to agree completely. Like if I had to give myself some advice back in first year is don't bury your head in the sand. Like if you're struggling, because I know in my A-level course, it was like the Northern Irish Board, which had no coursework to it. And I'd never done like an EPQ. Um, so, you know, I didn't have that much experience with the writing history, all those things um, that the department puts in place to help you just take advantage of them. And, you know, if you're worried about your grades, um, I would definitely say that reaching out to your personal tutor for help on that um, definitely helps. I think there's also, if we're talking about the big toolkit that we have to have when doing history, I think there's one thing that you kind of have to feel for yourself and ask your tutors for help with, and that's archival research. I personally really enjoy just being able to go into the British Library because I did a project on colonial Britain and just looking at the old documents. And for me, that is one of the most enjoyable parts. It's just the history. I mean, I don't really know how to describe it, but I'm sure a lot of you have similar opinions about it. I love that you brought that up, Lisa, because one of the things that we were thinking about when our earlier discussions um, was about how not only does the department give us or well, you this really amazing toolkit, right, to transition and to help you um, become more autonomous thinkers, become uh, better and stronger historians, but there's also every student I talked to says something. It's so flexible, right? There's so much flexibility built into this degree in terms of time periods so or chronology um regional focus interdepartmental modules or as jade is doing um modules in, in other universities and so it's this sort of this combination of the two sides right the sort of really helping you transition through through these kind of courses that are designed to help you develop certain skills and, and transition from that a level but also total freedom to take you know to follow your 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 dreams and your your intellectual pursuits and so I wonder just thinking a little bit about that transition from A level where often it's so prescribed right in high school what kind of history you do you you can't just say well actually I'm really interested in you know something that's not in the textbook or not in the exam board of that particular school and so I guess on, on the one hand it's quite scary to suddenly be given all this choice but on the other hand it can just uh, be transformative right so I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on that. I think one of the things that I did, and I, I often saw courses as being like isolated modules, like they would, that was just, I would do the history of, of modern Germany, and then I'd finally be able to move on to the good stuff next year, rather than seeing what can I take from that module that would influence other modules. And I think earlier on, I was describing to Chloe how Chloe had given me a suggestion about exploring um, theater in, on, the, on the frontier in, 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 in the Iberian Peninsula. And I was like, oh, I've never, never even encountered that as a prospect. But then in my next advanced seminar in my, in my following term, went up to my tutor and I was doing a Balkan history module and said, hey, what about if I did the frontiers of the Ottoman Empire in theatre? She was like, I've never heard that as a suggestion, but great, kind of run with it. And so I'm seeing where you can, using each course as a kind of this developmental kind of continuum that we've been talking about throughout and building on. Um, the, the courses and the modules that you've done in the past is a really healthy way of doing it rather than saying, right, finish with that. Let's never return to any of the ideas or concepts that I engaged with then and move on to the good stuff now. Um, so using this idea, of what can I learn from past experiences and past courses and modules that I've taken to build me up as a historian intellectually? Yeah, I just wanted to add, like, um, I think because UCL history is so flexible, uh, definitely in your first and to an extent second year, um, take advantage of all those like different modules and time periods and um, areas of history that you may want to pursue. So, for example, um, I took quite a risk in third year. Uh, I did medieval history for the first time. And if I hadn't enjoyed medieval history, luckily I did enjoy the module. But um, yeah, it, the, the point is that first year is all about taking risks um, and it's kind of testing the water to see what you enjoy. So I definitely would say, like, you know, try a range of different modules and types of history.
Um, yeah, so I, in second year, kind of, um, one of my modules wasn't exactly what I was thinking it was going to be, so I started taking it, and um, I didn't enjoy it that much. However, I find with, like, what Toby was saying, modules are never isolated, and the chances are something that comes up in one module will actually help you later down the line, and it just so happened that one of the examples I really liked within this module, which was in, like, um, it was in Poland in the 17th century, really not my forte, because I'm, like, modern 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 um but i used one of the examples that i encountered in that module in one of my later exams so um equivalent to pro approaching history now where you can draw in examples from all of your modules to like shape your answers and talk like um use it to talk about different types of history and how they've developed so um for me that was really it was really good luck because I was in the exam and I couldn't think of an example. And then this example came up from a module I didn't even enjoy. And I was like, oh, thank God I took it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is that even if you're not like one of your modules isn't really what you're expecting, it's all like part of the developmental process. And they like you will find that um, themes or like examples crop up elsewhere that you can actually use to like further like what you're actually specifically interested in. Yeah, I just wanted to add as well, um, it's quite nice for me because actually two of my tutors that I do modules with, Lily Chang in the past and uh, Chloe Ayrton obviously as well, um, it's quite cool because you can kind of take different modules with different tutors and kind of work out like who you enjoy working with and the kind of personal relationships that you build with particular tutors. So I would say as well, it's not just about like the type of history or the, um, you know, like the time period, for example, it's kind of the relationships that you build with certain tutors. Um, and that can really, really help in terms of making you produce good essays or even good history. Yeah, just going back to the idea of like making the most of um, all the different modules available and how they overlap. I think that also applies to interdepartmental modules. So um, something that I'm sure a lot of us have done are um, language modules. So I took a Spanish module this year and I would really recommend history students to do that. I think it's a great option that UCL offers. It's so accessible. And um, I mean, one of the sources I looked at this year was Portuguese and I was so annoyed at myself because I was thinking I should have chosen Spanish source because then I could have looked at the original version. But I know that one of my friends who actually does history with Spanish used his Spanish for the sources. So you can actually, especially with languages, you can really bring in that to help with your history, which you might think are completely separate. But I think it's really good to sort of make the most of that. In first year, I didn't do a Spanish module and I really regretted it. And I think I would recommend to people coming in really make the most of you being able to do any modules you want to within history and within um, the university as a whole. I wonder, you know, for me as a as a teacher and a personal tutor, and I'm sure Lily would agree with me and she might want to come in on, on this particular uh, sort of next segment, but it's just one of the things that I'm always so amazed by and, and, and is, is this massive transformation of study skills, right, and academic skills that goes on from that first week of arrival to graduation. You, know, you, you arrive sort of having done a history A-level and you leave with a dissertation in primary sources and historiographical framing and with all these intellectual interests and, and trajectories. Um, and, you know, we were talking in our earlier discussions about um, learning how to deal with resources, learning how to do with historiography, developing a passion for a subject and voice came up a lot, right? Learning to find your voice as a writer, but also as a speaker, you know, in a, in a seminar discussion, your confidence. And for a lot of you, you were talking a lot about uh, organization, like just learning how to be organized, <laughs> which I guess is a skill that you'll take, you know, with you wherever you go in life, right? It's not, <laughs> um, and so I just wonder, um, you know, maybe a few of you might want to talk a little bit about some of these key transformations in study skills and academic skills that have taken place in your own lives and the struggles that you've had with it, right? And how maybe uh, we as um, academic staff, you know, have, have helped to support or, or, or how, our, how our modules have tried to support you through that. Um, and I think specifically one of the things that I find a lot, my seminars are very talkative and, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of students who, who really fear the talking in the seminar, right, and really fear that contribution. And I know that all of you now, towards the end of your degree, um, have sort of got past that in many ways. So maybe we could reflect a little bit on that, those first words that you speak in a seminar and, and, and how to do it. Um, I wonder, Jade, what, what your thoughts are about the transformations in your life and study skills? Um, yeah, so one of the biggest things coming to university for me was actually having the confidence to say like I in an essay, because I remember at A-level, you're so deterred from like having a strong opinion about anything because you have to 
equally argue both sides and then come to a conclusion that's like mediating between two points of view. And I think for me, the biggest thing coming to university was, yes, I can debate, but like I can have a strong opinion as well. And I, I have the confidence to be like, this is what I think. This is my evidence. And actually like put my name into a conversation with like other historians. Um, I think it's like a, it's a big transformation to actually realize that at university you are a historian. You're not just a student learning history. Um, and you you do have a right to disagree with other historians and argue your own point of view. Um, and that was something that actually seminar participation really helped me with because I, in first term, was too shy to put my hand up if I didn't agree with what someone was saying or if I had a different opinion on something. And then I started doing it a lot more in second term and I found I just got so much more out of my seminars because I was testing my ideas with the academic that was teaching the session and they would challenge me back and it would make me think completely differently about what I was saying. And it's just so beneficial, especially when you come to write essays, because those debates that you've had in the seminar will like be playing around in your head and they will influence like like analytical skills and like hone them in. Um, so I think it's yeah, really finding your own voice is like such a big transformation. And it's like one of the most rewarding parts of like the transition from A level to university, I think. Um, yeah, so I was in a class with Lily in second year and I remember asking her about third years and kind of been like, you know, how do they have so much confidence? And I was kind of saying, like, I don't feel like I found my voice. And I remember her telling me, like, you know, it's just a matter of time. It's all about confidence building. And, you know, that's the thing. You will find it. Um, and it's just, you know, don't expect that to happen immediately. It's kind of you will um, almost be forced to keep up, like, contribute more just because uh, you gradually build up confidence develop skills, change the way in which you think. So um, yeah, I wouldn't expect immediate results. I would just kind of wait and see what happens. Um, touching on study skills, I was going to briefly talk about note taking. Um, earlier, we were all discussing how we sort of came to uni and didn't really know how to take notes. And most of the work you're going to be doing is reading all these different articles and chapters and having to take notes. And initially, I would just write down everything because I didn't think it was up to me to decide what was relevant and irrelevant from this fantastic historian's article. And over time, you learn that, you know, you can choose what you're interested in or what's relevant to the seminar. And something that I would really recommend you do is please page number your notes because I didn't do that in first year and it's a complete nightmare and it's a lot, your notes are a lot better and you can understand the argument a lot better if you just have your page numbers, you write down the key argument and say there's a lot of good, for example, on page 20, there's a lot of good evidence on this. And in your essay, if you're going back and you're thinking, oh, I want evidence on that, you can go to that page rather than spending hours writing every single specific evidence in that article that you think might be relevant for your essay that you're doing later or for your seminar. So I think that's something that definitely took time for me. And I still think that I'm can be inefficient with note taking, but I hope I've got a bit better over time. I kind of wanted to build a bit on what Jade said about having your own opinion in essays, because I think that also we come to realise that it comes through in seminars as well. When you are able to read a, an article or a chapter from a book and you're able to have your own opinion and understand that you don't agree with that person, and that you think that is wrong and, and that is when you really need to voice it in the seminar and that's how personally I think I get the most out of it by trying to critique someone else's work by maybe like an avenue that they took that I don't necessarily agree with and I think having that debate with the author and then with your classmates and with your tutor is what really takes you to the academic history level away from the A-level history. The academic transition in terms of fostering independence, I would just want to jump in here to say that it's trying to encourage students to challenge you to think differently, not just how you might think differently, but how do you go about doing that and doing that respectfully with other colleagues and with um, other scholars, but also allowing you to build up that confidence so that you can try different things, whether they're different periods, different modules, um, and making that argument um, by way of asking questions and also feedback. And I think one of the things from the academic perspective that I just wanted to jump in here to say is that all of the tutors have office hours, and I hope that the students will have used and taken advantage of the drop-in office hours to ask your tutors questions. I spend a lot of my time during office hours just 
speaking to students, whether it be about an academic concern or um, other welfare concerns, but also providing feedback to help you build um, the confidence so that you can engage with the historiography or perhaps um, in the earlier years when you start out at UCL, you're not quite sure when the best moment is is to um, speak up and interject during a seminar. And I, I would encourage my students to come and see me and say, well, in a seminar of 15, how do we go about doing that so that you can maximize your learning without, um, and, and making that transition as smooth as possible, perhaps um, in a private setting in um, a tutor's office hours to begin with so that the student can build the confidence to do so in a larger seminar setting. Yeah, I just wanted to build on what Lily was saying about thinking differently. Um, I wouldn't say be like disheartened if like a tutor questions you on a particular point or issue, um, maybe like critiques, you know, the way that you're addressing a particular issue. I think it's that's that's quite good because it almost forces you to like adapt your strategies or maybe like tackling an essay question. Um, so I wouldn't ever take that as like criticism. It's just, you know, part of the character building process to make you become a better historian at UCL. If I could ask you all about your experience of um, finding your place and your voice in the academic community, specifically in terms of how you relate to your tutors, because I think one of the, the big areas in which you have to make this transition is recognising that there's a difference in being an undergraduate student and how you relate to your, your peers and your tutors compared to being at school and how you related to your teachers. Um, and I think this this could also be quite different depending on what kind of school you went to. So uh, that could be within the UK, but also we have students from all over the world and different academic traditions are different in different places. University traditions are very different in different places. So I'm interested in, in your experience of, of making the transition between relating to teachers compared to university tutors um, and maybe how you would characterise that relationship that you now have with with your tutors um so i for me coming to university was a very pleasant surprise because i came from like um quite a small state school um where basically teachers didn't really have time to like actually sit and have like intellectual conversations with you because they were too busy doing other things or like planning lessons um so it was really nice coming to university, having heard a lot of scare stories about not knowing your tutors very well or like being really isolated from your academic staff, coming into the history department and realizing that it's actually like, it's a very nice community environment, um, especially like in the history building itself, you will always run into people that teach you or like tutors that you know, and they are always more than happy to spark up conversation with you and ask how you're doing um and i just think it's it's such a nice dynamic to feel like you can actually go and speak to your tutors and you're not like a hindrance on their time or like they they have anything better to do like they actually make a lot of time to sit and speak to students um and i think that was a really like pleasant surprise for me having heard that university is quite a cold environment in terms of like student teacher relationships and that's really not the case in history at all um, I came from a different background because I was an international, so I went to boarding school. It was quite a small one, but I feel there was very, very A-level heavy. And all the teachers, even though they were lovely, it was more of a teach, make them get the grades, that's it. And even though I had good relationships with them, it was never anything beyond the grades. And I think coming to university and realising that your personal tutor actually wants you to do better and they want to push you to think more academically and they want you to be intellectually engaged with the subject was very, very refreshing in a way. And honestly, my personal tutor is David Sim and he helped me a lot when deciding where to go in year abroad because there were so many choices and I really did not know what to do. But just knowing that you have this it's almost it's less than a teacher student relationship it's more of a like a mentor I'd say because you have this informal yet very very useful and guiding relationship with your tutor and it was just something I didn't expect from my university experience at UCL but it came to be a very very useful tool. Yeah and kind of just like jumping on something that Lisa said um, about like the academic 
interest and like the willingness to have an intellectual conversation I find that's something that is common among students as well and like peers and I think that's quite a change from school because for me personally at school me liking my subject made me like a bit of a nerd and I didn't really have anyone else to like chat with about my favorite kinds of history and what I found interesting and coming to UCL is so refreshing because you find that almost everyone really really enjoys what they do and there is like that everyone's passionate about history and they're they're really excited to hear about other types of history that they're not interested in but like they like hearing like about your interests and I think that's a really refreshing environment to be in because it does foster like that passion and you're like oh that's why I like history it's like it really does feel like an academic community at like all levels which I think yeah is very very nice yeah I definitely think it says a lot about the quality of the course that so many of my friends like when we meet up like you'll be talking about what you're studying and actively engaging in it and you know you don't you didn't quite do that probably with your friends when you're at school you'd rather talk about other things than your studies but going back to the relationship with your personal tutor I was going to say one of the differences as well is that it's very much um, kind of what you make it um, some people don't really find the need to go and see their personal tutor much um, but it definitely benefits you I think to have that support um, on campus it's someone to talk about academic ideas with but also more pastoral issues if you just need support yeah and I'm so glad that you've all brought it up so much and, and Carrie's question for our panel you know in, in a few days time where we're going to be really talking about uh, what is pastoral support and what does a personal tutor do and, and I think all of these discussions we've been having over these days will be really generative right for organizing uh that discussion um, in a few days time. I guess I really wanted to sort of move the conversation a little bit um, back to the original, one of the original questions about the intellectual flexibility of being a UCL history student and, and taking that a question further to think about, you know, going out, what is the significance of going outside of your comfort zone, right? And so if at school you've been learning about 20th century European history um, and wars and whatever it's been, and you get to UCL history, maybe you take a course that sort of is something that you know because it's safe, but also a lot of you have really um, gone well and far outside of your comfort zones. And I wonder a little bit, what was the process of making that decision? Um, you know, what's been, what was what it illuminated for you? And thinking about it a little bit in terms of, um, you know, how have some of the uh, earlier toolkit classes we were talking about, right? Those sort of early transition courses helped you. Um, so how has approaching perhaps helped you in a, in a module that's so far out of your comfort zone? And so I'm just interested to think about the transition of those intellectual journeys, but also the risks that a lot of you have taken and, and the really interesting risks. Um, I don't know whether Toby might want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think I'd quite appreciate it when I arrived is just how exciting ideas and pushing the boundaries of ideas are. And I think a healthy intellectual and academic environment is one which fosters the ability for students to push those kind of boundaries and to explore new and interesting ideas. I think I'd probably I probably sign up for, to do a history degree for the, all of the wrong reasons. I thought facts and like very hard and fast things were really cool. And I like I loved being able to tell people about how many bombs were dropped during the Second World War. And that might have an interest to some students and then they might enjoy that. But the ability to develop within the history of ideas and explore things that were beyond like these th theories and concepts and categories that we were being introduced to in our first and our second years. Well, for me, where the sort of sounds a bit cliche, but where the magic happened, where I really find, found my footsteps and went, hey, there's a lot to run with here. Um, and that's by no means saying I sort of, I've got it all figured out, or completely the opposite. There's, there's so much uncharted territory, but it's, it, it's, it became a process that was exciting. And it was something that I thought, hey, once I started approaching things, there are ideas that are exciting and engaging to, to be in all of these courses that I'm taking. Where can I take little bits from that, that build me up as an intellectual historian or whatever it is that I was specializing in? Um, and just being really engaged and excited by exploring things. Uh, and I think that would be an attitude I wish I had in, in September of 2017 when I arrived, when, rather than like, how many quick facts can I memorize to show my, my friends how much I'm learning from my course? Um, yeah. So I could just speak to Drew because I know you've been really outside of your comfort zone in the sense that you've taken courses you know, that Lily's teaching, that I'm teaching, you've sort of been all over the place. So you know, what's your experience of going outside of your comfort zone? Yeah, so I did uh, in second year, like all my modules were kind of Asian history. Um, and now I find myself in third year um, doing a lot of European religious history. Um, but I think for me personally, like if, 
if I'm going on the kind of track as in like what would I have liked to have known in first year it is like question everything um <laughs> so uh, there's like no right answer don't ever make generalizations it's, so like if you have like so key terms so um maybe like question the different meanings or pick out possible meanings um that these terms like might have um and I think that'll like force you to think creatively and really produce some interesting ideas that then you can apply in your essays and discussions etc I think for me going out of my comfort zone is how I found my current interests so first year chose a random course I'm still doing Latin American history to this day and I seek to choose a module on it every single year and even in my year abroad and I think what's really rewarding about trying to step out of this school curriculum and do something that you haven't seen before is the fact that within history, a lot of the histories are kind of erased by the Western sort of way that we teach history. And so, for example, my year abroad, I took a module on the history of the Islamic world from its very beginnings to present day. And the textbook, which was just a book written uh, that we used for the course, was basically written by someone who was a textbook editor. And his motivation to write the book was because when he was editing a world history textbook, there was only half a chapter in the Islamic world. So that motivated him to write a whole book about the Islamic world history. And I think being able to kind of go into those histories that we kind of ignore under the notion of world history is what's very, very exciting about going out of your comfort zone and what you expect from history when you're at school. Yeah, kind of linking to that, I think what I've always said is when I came to UCL, I thought I had a really good idea of what history was. And the more you go through your course, the more you question what history actually is. And it's confusing, but it's like the most rewarding thing because you just realise that like everything can be questioned and nothing is set in stone. And that is both terrifying and liberating because it makes you feel like you are able to actually add something. And like history is not this like set in stone record that you have no right to add to. It's more like a conversation and you have a right to contribute to that conversation. And I've just found that the more I've questioned and the more I've like looked into different avenues has actually led me to exactly like the interests I have today. So I just finished my dissertation and I wrote about film history, which I never thought I would write about when I first came to UCL because I didn't even know it was a thing. So, yeah, I mean, it just I think realising that you don't understand history is actually quite is quite rewarding and you're constantly learning and thinking differently about it. Um, and I think that's the sign that, you know, you're you're at a university level when you question things more than you know things. And yeah. Um, so going outside your comfort zone, I think at UCL also extends not just to the modules, but I think the fact that we're in London and we're so lucky that we have all these resources. And I suppose as a second year, I shouldn't be the one talking about this because the third years probably have a lot more to say about archival research and all of that. But we are very lucky that we have the British Library and, and all these different um, sort of resources available, the Senate House, SOAS Library, for whatever you're interested in. The UCL Library itself is fantastic, but if you want to go into something really niche in London, there's always the resources to do that, even if there isn't a lot of writing on it. So I would recommend, you know, if you're interested in areas and it only is touched on briefly in your module, you still have the freedom to go and learn about that. So you can even outside of your comfort zone within a module um so yeah that's something that I think is really exciting about um history in London specifically I just wanted to quickly add like there's no um set structure in terms of how you do your history degree like for example I'm still interested in Asian history and just because I did my dissertation on the Iberian world with Chloe doesn't mean I don't have like any interest for Asian history at all so it very much is about like it's up to you in terms of how you want to study you might want to progressively get a deeper and deeper understanding on a particular area maybe like it's colonial america or something like that um, and as you go through the years you might want to build up a more in-depth understanding of that particular topic equally you can just completely branch out try different things and um, you know enjoy history that way One of the things that's been really on my mind ever since we started talking this morning, um, you know, in, uh, when we were trying to sort of think of what it was that um, what we would like to pass on to new students, is um, this theme, really strong theme, that you all feel like you've become part of an academic community. 
over the course of the three years, right? Whether it's learning how to distinguish historiography, learning how to engage in historiography, find your voice in historiography, um, make original arguments, do research, right? Do research that's, that's going to show, shed new light on an old question um, in your dissertations or research seminar essays, or just an academic community within the department, right? Sort of some of you will develop friendships that will last a lifetime with each other, maybe around history or around social things with history. Others of you will develop relationships with your tutors, you know, where they will probably be writing letters of references for you for many, many years, right? And will always be very interested to know where you are and what, what you did. And so it's kind of really interesting to think of you all as transitioning into this academic community, which some of you will now be um, you know, moving on from, but it will always be part of, um, you know, your insect direction. If I think about my own undergraduate experience, certainly, um, you know, that was, uh, I, it was a really big moment, right, in, in sort of becoming part of this conversation, whether or not you go on to become an academic, and most people won't, of course, but you want to do other things. Um, but I guess I wanted to ask you, all, and, and some of you mentioned it uh, uh, earlier this morning, thinking about the um, undergraduate coursework, the essays or the research that make you the historian who you are today. Right. So if we think about all of the transition that you've been through, um, you know, some of you would have wrote a dissertation that's made you who you are today. Some of you it might be an approaching history essay. Right. You did an approaching history essay on gender and it opened up a whole world of, of, uh, of, of intellectual work. So I just wonder if you might want to reflect a little bit on, um, you know, any coursework or essay or writing you might have done a project that makes you who you are today. And perhaps the links across the modules right in this broader academic community that we're all part of. Um, I know Lisa, you know, has has a lot to say on this, so so perhaps I'll I'll give you the floor. I think for me, the year abroad that doing the year abroad with ECL was the most eye opening experience. I initially went into the year abroad program because I just did not know what I wanted to do with my life. So I thought, hmm, doing another year, adding anything to my degree, the degree is going to be going to be four years. I'm going to hopefully decide what I want to do by then. And honestly, finishing my second year, had no clue what I wanted to do. The UCL History Society went to a school in Croydon to talk to children about what we do. And all of them asked me what I wanted to do. And I just went, I have no idea. And I think this year abroad has been the most academically eye-opening experience for me because I got to do so many different things. And being able to do five courses at a time, even though it's a lot, but stepping away from UCL and then being able to come back next year with kind of a fresh viewpoint and having practiced my essay writing way more than I thought I would. It's kind of, it's really, really stimulating. And that's why I kind of started thinking about going into academia because at one point I sat down and I thought this academic community, I just thought I never really want to leave this. Because I was thinking about what I still want to do as my job and I still don't know. And I was just thinking about how long can I stay in the in the education system just doing this. So, yeah, I think this year has been quite a life changing experience for me. Um, for me, it was probably second year, I think, because um, as a second year, you're kind of thrown in with third years. Uh, with some of the modules that we take so um, you know the standard is much higher you're with people who have kind of got one more an extra year of experience over you um, and that kind of forces you to step up because um, for me personally I was like wow these people know what they're talking about I want to try and be like them um, and I think it's quite inspiring like these modules didn't really put me off history so much I think it kind of encouraged me to develop my own voice um, and you know try and emulate their confidence so yeah first year is about like kind of easing into the UCL life just in general um, and getting to grips with history and then I think second year is where it really begins to pick up in terms of pace um, because there's that extra bit of pressure which is not like you know a negative thing it's just it forces you to apply yourself more and I think that for me was really part of like my development as a historian at UCL. Um, I would say for me, you know, I've noticed a transformation from first year. I just, you know, I felt I went in with the attitude just trying to get as good marks as I could get through. And the transformation really was realizing that history is more than just like critical thinking. It's like the key to it is creativity, because that's what you're really trying to do. For instance, in second year, 
um, when I did the extent the advanced um, the research seminar approaching history from trying to apply your own ideas into it. it's no longer just a textbook experience um, that was a transformation for me um, I think for me a big part of it was um, feeling like kind of on equal footing with lecturers and academics so in second year I really started exploiting like office hours a lot more and I'd go and like discuss my ideas with my tutors. And a good thing about UCL is a lot of the lecturers do are doing their own research as they teach you. So it is more like a reciprocal process because them teaching us their content is a way of like honing in their ideas and kind of like refining them and figuring out what works and what doesn't. And I think that is a really rewarding experience in that you feel like in some small way you might even shape how their research goes because I remember going to my tutor in second year um, showing her a source that I'd found in LSE Women's Library for part of my research seminar and she was like wow like I didn't know that existed she was like that is so exciting you need to pursue that she was like I'm interested in pursuing that too and it's just yeah I feel like what Lisa was saying like being part of the academic community does feel so good and I also don't want to leave so yeah um yeah I've got one more thing to add in terms of like tutors I think for me as well um kind of making that distinction between perhaps like an A-level tutor or a high school tutor um a tutor at UCL isn't really like your superior it's kind of someone you can go to just to have a casual like conversation with um maybe they know more about a particular subject than you do but I think it's like a nice chance for you to casually like talk about the issues or arguments that you might want to make or ideas. Um, so I definitely like try and encourage prospective students to not see tutors as this like intimidating like body of people who uh, are kind of like going to lord over you and sort of be like, you know, I know way more than you do. I think to try and come to your tutor as like a an academic friend almost just to have like a casual conversation and that's quite relaxing and reassuring. It's so fascinating to hear about all the different ways that you have become part of different academic communities and conversations, whether they're locally in our department or more uh, on a broader scale in terms of academic conversations. And of course, one of the things we haven't talked about is interdisciplinary, right? Some of you have actually gone off and joined other academic communities in sociology, languages, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's it's uh, new students who are on their way in probably haven't thought about this as something that will happen to them, you know, throughout the course of their degree. So I think it's really valuable these insights that you've brought and sort of capturing this moment of how you feel now. And of course, those of you who go off to do an MA will feel differently in a year. Those of you who go off into the world of work um, and leave history behind, you know, will reflect very differently on on that value and and, and your relationships to that community, right, as time goes on. Um, but I wonder whether any of the um, any of you have any questions for each other, um, you know, to sort of build on some of these issues, or perhaps our staff guests um, as well, Lily and Carrie, might have anything they want to bring into the conversation before we kind of wrap up. Um, so I just want to open the floor in case anyone um, would like to uh, comment on on any element of our discussions. Um, I just think one thing I would just say to like prospective students is to like we've we've touched on it but like really do just try and like enjoy what you're doing because there's such a tendency coming from a level and there's this mentality that you need to like get the result to like get into university and it's like your essays and your research shouldn't be seen as so much a means to an end you should see the process as rewarding in itself um for me, as soon as I started enjoying the research aspect of all my essays and didn't just try and get it done, I started like getting better grades and I was really thriving in my degree instead of just trying to churn out essays like every few months. And it was it, that's when I decided that actually this is what I enjoy doing. Like the research part of it is my favourite part and like finding what I'm going to argue and finding sources that shape my argument. And for me, like enjoying that process has made my results just get better by like naturally um so I think yeah it's it's a process that like it doesn't come straight away but it definitely is one of the most rewarding moments when you sit back and realize oh you know what like the grade doesn't really the matter that that much it, the important thing is that I'm enjoying what I'm doing and it's shaping me and I feel like I'm actually learning how to think differently and I think that is like one of the most rewarding rewarding things that UCL history offers Building on that a bit is 
just don't panic if the first ever module that you do does not interest you immensely and you don't feel the same way as quite a lot of us feel in third year when we do know that we want to stay in this academic community because most likely the first thing you do at university will not exactly be your cup of tea and the thing is to just not stress about it not freak out don't immediately think that university is not for you and then you're not the right fit just kind of try to ride it out speak to some people speak to your tutors do your own research and try to find something that you will actually maybe enjoy yeah I just wanted to add to that as well um it'll be very very rare where you do modules throughout three years at UCL that you're going to love equally like I've done some modules that I hated or I didn't like um and I love history like I absolutely love it um so it it means that like you know not every single day at UCL is going to be the best you're not going to do modules that you particularly enjoy but it's all part of like you know a process of what you like and what you don't like so I wouldn't like yeah lose hope if you do do a module that you don't like or maybe a tutor who isn't perhaps uh suited to your kind of learning style I just want to add that um, having the pleasure and the privilege of teaching wonderful students in UCL history, the one thing I always encourage all of my students or um, whether I teach them in an academic setting or I bump into them in a stairwell is that to ask the questions, to ask as many questions as you have. There are no such things as silly questions or stupid questions. Um, and if you don't know something, ask. Um, someone will have the answer. If your tutor doesn't have the answer, your tutor can point you in the direction of someone who will have the answer. Uh, most of the time, the person who has the answer will be Carrie. Um, and, but just to ask the questions and also the, um, eventually you will find a group of peers who share the same interests as you, whether they're academic or social, in a very like-minded way. They'll be your friends, they'll be your peers, they'll be other fellow students, both within the department or outside of the department, who will all be sharing with you in that longer journey of your time at UCL from um, your first year through to your second, your third. There will be a community that continues after UCL. The alumni community comes back on an annual basis, if not more frequently. It is the, it is the sort of one experience that, that is shared amongst everyone, um, irrespective of how old you are, where life takes you later on. Um, and I and I still hear from a lot of my own students years on. Um, they write to me to just give me an update on their lives, or they write to me to um, say that they had read something in the news and they they thought of a particular module that I taught. And it's always even even for students whom I've never had the pleasure of perhaps teaching. It's always very nice to see them in the corridors of the department, or to hear from other colleagues how another student from a particular module or year group may have done. Thank you so much for that amazing contribution, Lily. And I think it really like sums up the way a lot of us, uh, us the staff, feel right about um, your inclusion into the in this intellectual community um, and, and the relationships that we build, which of course are professional relationships, but they're also intellectual relationships, and they and they go on. I mean, I still am in touch with you know if you were to ask me the the essay that marks me as a historian, which is probably my second year in my undergraduate, and the person who led that course, you know, is still someone I'm in touch with, right? And um, it's definitely you know these things are very very formative. Um, so I guess I just wanted to wrap up and just thank you all so much for this really really interesting panel, which came together the last minute when we were trying to think of what to do to um, to talk about you know, to, to replace what had been another panel on induction. And I just think it's fascinating to hear about all of your experiences um, in that sort of transition, the intellectual and academic transition um, from your high schools into undergraduates. And you know, to wish all of you who are about to graduate, uh, you know, really well, like to wish you well on your next journey and, and all the next transitions you're going to be uh, going on. Uh, so we're really so privileged to have had you here, captured you in this moment before you go off <laughs> and for the next generation of students to be able to watch uh, this video and others like it about, you know, your experiences. Um, so really, thank you all so, so much. Mm -hmm.